Good evening. This is uh, great to see you all here on a Monday night and packing the house here at SF Jazz. Uh, as um, many of you have seen, and I finally uh, remembered to actually announce it last time, we do have receptions here on the mezzanine after these events, and uh, they have a bar that allows you to bring drinks into the event, which is awesome. Um, but And along those lines, I have a, a special announcement tonight along the lines of our salon project, and that is that we have uh, hired a person uh, for our uh, bar and cafe manager, and it's uh, Jennifer Collio, who uh, many of you might know from Small Hand Foods, who makes all the amazing uh, syrups uh, for bartenders here. There's a few cocktail nerds I just heard clapping. Uh, and uh, she's actually, she's here tonight, and I'm gonna have her uh, come up and explain to you a couple of the drinks that she's made for tonight that were inspired by uh, tonight's talk. Jennifer, come on up. Oh, wow, this light's so bright. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for, um, thank you so much for having me. Um, it's a, a real pleasure to be part of this organization. Um, so as Xander said, I have a couple cocktails that I'm making tonight. Um, and um, up until the opening of our salon, uh, I'm going to try to um, pair some cocktails with each of the talks that we do. So um, tonight, within the keeping of the theme, I have two cocktails. One's called the penicillin. Um, it's, not, um, it's not actually one of my cocktails. It's um, a gentleman from New York from Milk and Honey named Sam Ross who came up with this cocktail. It's some um, smoky scotch, lemon, ginger, and honey. Kind of feels medicinal. Um, delicious. Uh, and then I'm also doing, inspired by the, the Pueblo jars that were found with theobromide residue in them, um, signifying the, the, um, that chocolate had, had arrived to, the, um, to North America. Um, I'm making a, a, a spiced hot chocolate with tequila and um, green chartreuse marshmallows. And now uh, I've been making them up there and I apologize because I was told that you guys don't drink very many cocktails, so I didn't, I didn't make that much of the batch and we're almost out already. So <laughs> I'm sorry, and next time I'll make more. Um, but uh, so I hope you enjoy. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jennifer. And I, I think there's there's plenty of extra green chartreuse marshmallows, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I highly recommend just go steal a green chartreuse marshmallow. They're the most amazing marshmallows you've ever had, even if you don't get the uh, to to the chocolate. Uh, so two other things that I wanted to mention about the salon tonight. Um, one is that I, I made an announcement a while back uh, that um, Brian Eno is going to be doing the sound for the ambient sound for the whole space. He's also um, going to be doing a video and sound installation in the one small room that we have in the back with a, a window with a view of Golden Gate Bridge. Um, it's going to be kind of a, a triptych version of uh, 77 million paintings with some custom uh, versions of it just for our space as well as the sound that'll be in that small room. So it'll be a great little space um, and we're still looking for uh, sponsors on the level to underwrite uh, that as well as the, the sound system that we're, we're now working on. So if you if you feel inspired, please come and talk to me about that. The, um, we're about $200,000 away from, uh, from actually finishing all of our funding, but we are under construction. We are making hires. Uh, I saw them trenching in all of the plumbing just today, and it's, uh, it's really looking awesome. I'm pretty excited about it. And we're going to be able to uh, we're going to be able to have uh, you know really cool 60 to 80 person kind of salon style of events. I know we have at least one booked uh, now with uh, Adam Rogers on his new book Proof: The Science of Cocktails. So we're going to have we'll have things that are not just cocktail related, but we also have a lot of great uh, cocktail related talks and and drink related talks, which I'm excited by. Uh, the last thing that I wanted to mention is our challenge coins. And some of you may know that if uh, if you have donated over $100 to the salon, you will have you should have already received one of these challenge coins in the mail. And uh, the history of the challenge coin is a military tradition. And if if you were in a squad and you showed up to a bar and you pulled out your challenge coin for your squad, uh, if the other members of your squad didn't produce it, then they had to buy drinks. And if they all produced it, you had to buy all of them drinks. So tonight is going to be the first challenge coin event. Uh, it's, we're springing it on you. If you have your challenge coin, you can see Danielle and you can get a free coupon for one of the drinks uh, Jennifer just mentioned tonight. And underneath five 
armrest to your right. You have to go to your right armrest. There are five challenge coins taped underneath them. Any finders? They're taped with black gaffer's tape. They're pretty hard to find. They're right behind your cup holder. Anyone? Found one. All right. All right. So there's, keep looking, there's another four out there. Uh, there might be some empty seats. Well, no, they're mostly in this middle section here. You, you guys don't have any, I don't think. Sorry. Um, <laughs> So uh, that is, uh, those are all my announcements tonight. Um, please do as we approach the end of the year and you're uh, looking for uh, those donations to go out uh, for your various charities, please do consider the salon. And um, the last thing that I'm gonna introduce is the long short for tonight, which is actually comes to us from the, uh, the Smithsonian and it's kind of an intro to tonight's talk on some of the amazing 3D work that, uh, that they're doing in scanning all the 3D objects, or at least a current selection of the 3D objects in the Smithsonian that are kind of unvisitable in many other ways. And so this will be a, an intro to that, and then hopefully the rest of the talk you'll hear from Richard. Thank you. Here we are at the American History Museum. I'm standing in front of the gunboat Philadelphia. It was built in 1776. Uh, it was sunk that same year by the British. There were eight in total that were built, um, and those eight are often thought of as part of the beginning of America's Navy. So we're using a variety of 3D scanning tools, uh, some long range capturing the boat in its entirety at sort of medium resolution detail, and other very high resolution tools we're using uh, to capture some of the smaller bits of interest. The laser arm scanner has some very accurate encoders in each joint, and those encoders can tell the computer the exact position of this laser beam uh, in real time. So as we're scanning, we could see that, that bit of data popping up on screen. So we could see exactly what we've captured and what we haven't. Uh, so for objects that are geometrically complex or wherever there's really close quarters, uh, this is the ideal tool. And this data is going to be used to support research at the Smithsonian, and it's also going to be used as a public access tool. The gunboat itself is in very, very close quarters. So even if you're able to come to the Smithsonian in person, uh, you can only see a small portion of it. So that's part of the reason we're documenting this object in 3D. So we'll take that 3D model, put that online, so visitors uh, from the Smithsonian and also from around the world could explore this object in ways they simply could not, even if they were here in the gallery. We're here at Cornell University, and their team is allowing us access to a high-resolution micro-CT scanner. The great thing about this technology is that we're able to study the interior and exterior geometry of an object in a non-destructive process. We're thinking that maybe we could offset the walls of the flower. Yes, if we zoom in... So this is an exciting example of coevolution between a Corianthes orchid and Euglossian bees. The male Euglossian bee falls into the bucket at which point its wings become wet and it won't be able to fly out the same way it came in. It's forced to travel out a small hole in the back where pollen is exchanged onto the male Euglossian bee. The male Euglossian bee now carries the scent of the orchid which attracts female Euglossian bees for reproduction. So once we have the CT data of the orchid, we'll be able to understand more thoroughly how the orchid and Euglossian bee interact. Whether it's a rare orchid, a historic gunboat, or an archaeological site, we see a huge potential to discover and diffuse knowledge through a variety of 3D scanning methods. And what we're really looking forward to is the future watching this technology develop and apply this technology 
um, to the Smithsonian at a larger scale. I love all this digital stuff, but you know, <laughs> objects have uh, their own special appeal. Uh, I'm Stuart Brand from Long Now, and uh, let's be clear, I adore the Smithsonian. When I was in my early 20s and hanging out in Indian reservations and uh, wanting to put together a multimedia show called American Needs Indians, I found myself in the castle on the mall behind the rose window in Bill Sturdivant's office going through file drawers of photographs of American Indians back through the whole collective period of the Smithsonian. Um, tomorrow afternoon, my wife, Ryan Phelan, who runs a Long Now project called Revive and Restore, is going to be at the Smithsonian's brand new laboratory of analytical biology, uh, talking to the new head there about possibly working with them on the genetic restoration, genetic revival, genetic rescue of endangered species and extinct species. And we look for some collaboration there. One of our most beloved board members was once head of the Smithsonian's uh, American History Museum, Roger Kennedy. And indeed, uh, this book, the introduction, is by the secretary of the Smithsonian, um, Wayne Clough. He was here as a salt speaker just a couple of years ago. So it goes on. And tonight we got a whole bunch of Smithsonian for you. Richard Curran. Thank you. Sir. Yeah, that's about uh, five pounds of history uh, in this uh, in this uh, book. It's really a pleasure to be here uh, uh, tonight with you. Uh, thank you for being here. It's a lovely hall, SF Jazz. I haven't been here before, so it's just a marvelous, marvelous uh, uh, venue. Uh, tonight, I'm going to take you through a quick uh, uh, tour of, uh, of the Smithsonian and the book. How many people here have been to the Smithsonian? Okay, like a lot, like probably most of you. Okay, so the Smithsonian, you know, started in 1846, named after a guy, Smithson, James Smithson. Illegitimate child of British aristocracy. Okay, so he's kind of a little peeved at the, at the Brits. Uh, he was a chemist, he was a mineralogist, and uh, he really believed, he knew about Benjamin Franklin, he knew about Thomas Jefferson, he believed that somehow if you couple knowledge and democracy, you would have a really progressive society. Now, coming from Britain, he never visited the United States. He bet first on the French Revolution. Didn't turn out so well. And in 1826, he writes a will leaving his fortune to the people of the United States to found in Washington an institution dedicated to the increase and diffusion of knowledge, a very much an enlightenment kind of ideal. Uh, a, a wonderful ideal. At that time, his, he never visited. His fortune was worth $508,000, which would be about equivalent to $100 million today. What happened? The U.S. Congress had a debate. We just fought two wars with the Brits. Do we take the money or not? <laughs> well, it took Congress, what, 20 years to decide? <laughs> but eventually, we took the money, created the Smithsonian, and now the Smithsonian, with its museums, research centers, global presence, uh, houses about 137 million uh, objects uh, in the uh, museum. Not a chartreuse mushroom, uh, uh, mush <laughs> not chartreuse marshmallow <laughs> among them. We do have chartreuse mushrooms, by the way. <laughs> and that doesn't count photographs and, and, and miles and miles of archives that would stretch from here to the, uh, to the moon. Now, in doing this book, uh, I really took the idea, the publisher, uh, there's a guy, uh, uh, Neil McGregor, who headed the British Museum. He did a book, 100 Objects of World History. It was very popular. BBC did stuff on it. Really gave people an appreciation of the heritage of this planet using the collection of the British Museum. So the publisher of that said, called me up and said, hey, Richard, how about doing one on America? And I said, look, I'm, I'm the husband of a school teacher, you know, elementary school, public teacher. We don't teach history anymore. 
that American history is something, whether you're this way, that way, politically, whatever, history is something that binds us. There is an experience that we've been through and how you feel about it. Nonetheless, it helps make us who we are. I think it's really important to do. Uh, so I said I would do it under one condition. They said, what's the one condition? I said, well, you know, McGregor had 100 objects. We're Americans. We need 101. <laughs> Still no easy task, as you can imagine, and uh, I, I could talk later about how we got to uh, the objects. What I wanted to do in the book, and, you know, Stuart's exactly right. I mean, there's a lot of things with Long now and the Smithsonian that really tie, and one of the things I think is, and I think Wayne Clough said it when he was here, my boss, the secretary of the Smithsonian, that the Smithsonian is in the forever business. I mean, we really are in the forever business. We think about that all the time. Uh, so what I wanted to do in the book, and you know, you're telling the story of American history, when do you begin and when do you end? And so I felt it was important to bookend the 101 objects in the book with two very important ones. So I start out, the first object in the book there, number one, is the Burgess Shale. Burgess Shale comes from about 500 million years ago. And it tells the story of fossilized life on this continent. This is what Americans look like 500 million years ago. <laughs> and biologists... Canadians. Canadians, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I think we snuck American over there. The, uh, the, the, so the, these, these shells, biologists, evolutionary biologists, have used these shells. They're almost an imprint. They're not hard shells. They're not records of hard shells of creature. They really capture the soft tissue. They were captured in silt. And so they're, they're a great data set. They're almost like a prehistoric photograph of an explosion of life during the Cambrian era. So I started off 500 million years ago, and I ended um, the last object, number 101, is a telescope that we are now building in Chile. Now, I don't know if this thing points. You see the arrow up there? That points to a human being. Uh, so you get the size of this telescope. Okay, now the scientists and engineers, they get it all the time, but for the rest of us, you know, when you look up at the sun, you're not seeing the sun now, you're seeing it as it was eight, million, eight, eight minutes ago. This telescope will allow us to see so far in space, we will see back 12.8 billion years in the past, about a billion years after the Big Bang. And I included this because when you get that perspective, this, this, this is being fabricated now. We're building it in Chile with a consortium of Smithsonian and others. Uh, it'll be done in 2020, which is probably a good idiom for, for, for a site. But the idea is to capture that same sense of, you know, the exploration. Uh, humankind, human beings have always looked up in the sky and wondered what's the significance of all that stuff up there for all of us down here. And this is a scientific way into that answer. So I thought I'd bookend, you know, American history by two objects that look both very far into the past. Of course, I, I love the irony because the, the last object will allow us to see the universe before the first object was created. Spooky. <laughs> okay, one of the points I try to make in this book is that the objects in the Smithsonian are not just pretty things to look at in cases, but they're the subject of ongoing research that our scientists and scholars and curators do. So, you know, we know that among the first uh, Paleo-Indians was Clovis culture. First Clovis point, when it was found, came to the Smithsonian. Smithsonian didn't know what to do with it. We didn't really believe at that time that uh, 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 ancient Indian cultures went back that far. We debate that right now. So most the conventional theory, most popular uh, uh, among scholars, is that North America was populated by people coming over from Asia, over right Siberia, Alaska, the Bering Strait, and down the down the down the coast. Uh, that is by far the majority opinion. But we got an ornery guy, Dennis Stafford, at the Smithsonian, who's looking at these Clovis points, and you know a lot of the Clovis points were first found in the West. Well. Venice is finding them in the east, in the Chesapeake Bay. And so his theory is there may have been another migration, and some of those migrations may have been earlier, coming from the east. How can you figure this out? You got to look at those Clovis points. You got to figure out where they're from, how they're made, and so on. So the stuff that people see in cases, we're actually at night, just like that movie, Night at the Museum. We're taking <laughs> the stuff out of the cases and looking. 
Okay, as you'd expect in the Smithsonian and in this book, you know, we tell the story of American Indian cultures and Columbus and Pocahontas and the missions and Plymouth Rock and, and, and among the things that we have in the Smithsonian are slave shackles that tell the story, help tell the story of slavery. Um, when you look at these objects, though, as a curator or, or a scholar, you're always interrogating the object. So when you think about Pocahontas, the painting on your uh, left represents what we have as an engraving of Pocahontas from 1616 in the Smithsonian. Notice her visage, notice her cheeks. The other painting comes from about two years later. What do you notice about Pocahontas? Even in the 1600s, the Brits are making Pocahontas look whiter. <laughs> Okay? She's Christianized, and you have the whole notion of the, uh, the civilizing effect of colonization in America. So we look at these objects carefully. And you know what that is, right? Plymouth Rock, right? <laughs> We're close to Thanksgiving, Plymouth Rock. So Plymouth Rock, when the, the pilgrims got off at Plymouth, it wasn't like there was a big rock sitting there that they got off on. <laughs> Okay, this Plymouth Rock was kind of manufactured about 100 years later, 120 years later, as a kind of founding myth of the country. But, you know, founding myths have an interesting thing. They start becoming real. And when Alex de Tocqueville is in America in the, and writing about America in the 1830s, he writes... Well, he wasn't Jewish, so he went to say these Fakakta Americans and Meshuggah <laughs> Americans, but, but it was something like that. Like, you can't believe these Americans. You know, they think they landed on this rock, and now they're writing on it and turning it into tourist goods. It became a commercial industry. Okay. Everybody knows what that is, right? Declaration of Independence. Um, you were looking for the coins next to your seat. When you go home tonight, look at old pictures, look in the back of old picture frames. We do not have, one of the missing things people often ask me, what's missing in this book? The original Declaration of Independence. Now, this isn't a Nicolas Cage National Treasures movie. <laughs> it's real. And that is when the, first dec when the Declaration, when they decided on the Declaration of Independence, they, you know, they voted on July 2nd. John Adams writes, July 2nd is going to become a great national holiday. We don't celebrate July 2nd, because they figured they needed a statement to explain why we were doing independence. That was then voted on on July 4th. Remember a guy named Tom Jefferson? He kind of drafted it on a desk. We have the desk, and at the Library of Congress, we have his draft edited by Benjamin Franklin. Very well, I might add. They took, they, they, they then came with a final document. They sent it over to a printer across the street in Philadelphia, a guy named Dunlap. He printed up. Uh, uh, copies, they were sent to George Washington and others, and we don't know what he did with that original copy. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. You might have it. <laughs> uh, we have in the Smithsonian the kind of things that tell the story of our fight for independence from George Washington's sword and uniform. You know, that was a pretty handsome uniform that George Washington did. And he did it because he designed it himself. He ordered the material. And why did he do that? Because he didn't want the Brits to think that the Americans were a bunch of ragtag revolutionaries. He wanted to show that we had stature, we had standing. So he really spent a lot of time thinking about this uniform. Now, as I was doing this book, I learned a lot. I'm really not trained as a historian, an American historian. I'm trained as a cultural anthropologist. And so you're kind of trained to look at objects and wonder where they came from, why they are, they are the way they are, why they took the form they did. Anybody know what this is? Do I say? Anybody? Walking stick. Who's walking stick? Benjamin Franklin's. This is the walking stick. A year before he dies, Benjamin Franklin writes a codicil in his will. He writes a codicil saying, I leave this humble walking stick to my good friend George Washington. This could have been the scepter of a king. Okay? Instead, it is a humble stick crowned by the cap of liberty. What the heck was Franklin talking about? And I looked at this. This was given to him by a French lady. 
on, uh, just as the United States won its independence and defeated the British. And this was a celebratory present to Franklin. Franklin was our ambassador to France. So I'm looking at the gold doohickey up top on this stick and wondering, what is that? It's just some gold decoration, whatever. So you start getting into history and you, you kind of look at it, you look at the evidence, the documentary evidence, the letters, and so on. When Benjamin Franklin went as our ambassador to France, he was balding, it was cold, he needed a cap to wear. He brought a fur cap. Well, the French loved Franklin's cap. At the time, remember, the French are debating the same, some of the same things the Americans are. Rights of man. What's the natural condition? Of, what's the natural human condition? What's human nature? And so on. The French love Franklin because this fur cap signaled that somehow Americans, coming from this frontier place off of there, were closer to nature. And here was Franklin, who was so distinguished, an inventor, a scholar of great fame, and he's wearing a fur cap. So Franklin writes his daughter, you can't believe these people. I'm wearing a hat. They're making plates. They're making portraits. They're making medallions. Send me more fur caps. <laughs> so what is on Franklin's head? What is, the what is the cap? That is a fur cap. And Washington could have been king. This could have had a crown on it. It could have had a French powdered wig. Instead, it has a simple fur cap. In that one object is an encapsulation. It's almost like the Da Vinci Code. You know, it's almost like in that object, you get a sense of what American democracy is about. It's encoded in that one object. You know about this, George Washington. We have the original portrait in the, uh, in the Smithsonian. Uh, Philadelphia has another commissioned copy. Brooklyn, my hometown, has another copy. The one that Dolly Madison rolled up in the White House when they burned the White House? Not real. Um, but again, when you look at a portrait like this, if you look through the portals, you know, there's George Washington. It's a total made-up uh, setting. And, you know, you've probably seen this iconic thing, you know, a, a zillion times. But look over, um, you know, his extended arm, and you see through the, the portal there, through the window, so to speak, uh, um, storm clouds representing the revolution. Look in the other side of the picture, and you see the rainbow, the future of the United States. So again, Gilbert Stewart's encoding in this, this portrait of Washington the past and what he hopes is the future aspiration of, of the United States. Now, he was a little disappointed there because George Washington doesn't look so happy. Why doesn't Washington look happy? He just got a new set of false teeth. <laughs> so he looks a little pained. Um, one of our favorite, most iconic objects in the Smithsonian is the, this flag, not, not sewn by Betsy Ross, Star Spangled Banner. This is the flag that flew over Fort McHenry in that September, on September, uh, uh, the morning of September 14, 1814, Francis Scott Key, who wrote, Oh Say Can You See? Know that song? We, a lot of people sung it on Saturday and Sunday at football games across this country. But very few realize that it pertains to an actual flag. This is the flag that flew over Fort McHenry that Francis Scott Key out in Chesapeake Bay looked at the fort. He didn't know whether he'd see the American flag or he'd see the British flag. And however it went, so went our country. And of course, it was an American uh, flag. He composed uh, the poem that was turned into a song. That, that flag was loved to death. When it came to the Smithsonian, this is, how we, this is how it came. It was shortened by about eight feet. You see somebody cut out a star, people cut out swatches. It was loved to death. It became kind of a religious relic, a patriotic relic. Uh, we had to take care of it at the Smithsonian, and we hired a group of seamstresses led by Ann Fowler. She had developed a conservation technique to sew in 1.7 million stitches into this flag, putting it on linen, and therefore saving the flag. Well, for those of you who remember visiting the Smithsonian, and as Stuart says, when our good friend Roger Kennedy, who was on the board of Long Now and the head of the American History Museum, was head of the uh, American History, when you came there then, the flag hung and long, and we play the Star Spangled Banner, you know, at 10 and 2 and so on every day. Well, that hanging and the threads that we put in to save the flag, Roger and other realized it was actually destroying the flag. And so we had to go and take out 
1.7 million stitches. <laughs> And put the, you see the size of that, those, those, those stripes are about two feet wide and create a gantry and do this so we could preserve that flag for the American people uh, so that it, it, would, it would last and so that it would last forever. Uh, we, we built an oxygen-free chamber for it, so in that chamber, in case the whole, in case all of Washington burns again, in case the whole museum goes up in flames, the Star Spangled Banner will be safe and we get five million people a year that come before that flag. And what we do, if you recall the War of 1812, you know, which was a kind of funny war, we don't really know why it was fought, but it, it, was, over, it, it was all over the issue of, uh, of the British recognizing American citizenship. They were taking people off ships, and they saying, you're not American, you're British, you've got to serve in the uh, British Navy. Uh, so what do we do now? Well, the flag, again, is not just the historical artifacts, we actually swear in new citizens in, in Flag Hall, right in front of the Star Spangled Banner. So we recognize that act of citizenship that the British were denying back in the War of 1812. Very, very moving when that happens. Uh, in the book, I talk about the settlement of, uh, of the West, the frontier, from the Conestoga wagon that's largely used in the Appalachians that develops into a much smaller prairie schooner, to the compass that gets Lewis and Clark across the country still works. It costs five dollars. Uh, in the book, it costs five dollars then. Uh, in the book, I talk about the cotton gin. The cotton gin, you know, was developed, a lot of people working on invention, it often happens that way. Cotton gin was developed to take the, short, the seeds out of cotton, so it'd be more efficient in terms of uh, harvesting and processing. And um, Eli Gin's cotton gin was a great uh, revelation, the gin meaning engine. It, it improved labor, but it also made cotton a lot more profitable. And unintended consequences of invention, what it led, of course, was to the great expansion of slavery, because now you can grow a lot more cotton. It led Andy Jackson to, to kick uh, uh, Indians in the South off their land, because now their land could be used for cotton. It led for a massive growth of slavery in this country and that fueled uh, northern uh, mills and so on. It also helped fuel these things. At the Smithsonian, you know, the idea is how much to collect, whose stuff to collect, stuff being the technical term for the national collections. <laughs> and uh, I, I have uh, this uh, illustration in the book. We have all the patent models. The Smithsonian got the patent models. So that was a great source of collections at the Smithsonian. And here, within a, you get about a, within a three or four year period, look at all the different sewing machines you get. These are inventors coming up with a solution. What are they trying to solve? How do you join two pieces of cloth together? <laughs> and how do you do that in an efficient and high quality way? And um, so what, what, at the Smithsonian, the collections are not just, again, for show, but to help us study the process of innovation and how inventors work to come up with what they come up with. Of course, this, uh, this, uh, uh, these uh, sewing machines end up uh, sewing that uh, great American product, uh, jeans, right? Uh, Levi Strauss, and, uh, 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 that, that, uh, and the first jeans are uh, blue, but there's two types of jeans very early on in this town, in San Francisco. A blue, which we're fam familiar with, but also a brown duck jean. And we have a very early copy of that at the Smithsonian. Uh, another thing that helped build the country was the railroads, of course, and we have at the Smithsonian the John Bull. This was the first running locomotive in the U.S. that hauled you know, cars and passengers. The guys that built this, this ran all in Jersey, New Jersey, 1831. This came, this was manufactured in England, it, but, and we didn't have the manufacturing capability in the United States. It came in pieces. Imagine you're the crew now in Jersey in 1831. You've never seen a locomotive, and they tell you to build one. <laughs> so they had to assemble this locomotive. But what we have is great documentation about how this worked, because this really started the railroad industry in the country and really opened up uh, the country to mass um, um, uh, uh, transportation. Uh, at the top of this shot, you see what the train looked like carrying its tender, and you see the thing out in front of the train. What happened is, kind of an American story, you had an entrepreneur who wanted to build a railway, 
to connect New York and Philadelphia. He had to do it all through New Jersey. He laid the track very quickly, so the track wasn't laid well. So every time they put the train on, it would derail. So you had another invention, which was the thing out in front, the guide wheels, that would help keep the train on. Now, if you look below that, we have an, a record, a contemporary record, of what it was like to be on this train. There's a sculptor, an American sculptor, John Frazee, and we got his papers later at the Smithsonian Archives of American Art. And in those papers, he's writing a letter to his wife, and he draws the train he's on. He says, you can't believe it. This thing is belching steam. It's so powerful, it's giving me a headache. There's such noise. And then it took off like a shot, 15 miles an hour. <laughs> <laughs> so it gives you a perspective on things. Now, if you look at this other photo, uh, in the lower part, you know, where the train is actually running, that is not an old-time shot, that's, an old -time, uh, that's not an old-time reenactment. One of the things you get to do with the Smithsonian, it's a lot of fun when the curators, is when the people go home, you can take the stuff out. <laughs> and so we had our curators who, who oversee our transportation, they said, in 1981, for the 150th anniversary of that 1831 ride, how about if we fire up that old John Bull? We had a crane, put it on a truck, took it out to uh, th this railroad tracks by Georgetown by the canal. We put it on there. They fired her up. Those are not old-time guys there. Those are curators of the Smithsonian driving that train in 1981. <laughs> Still worked. Amazing. Uh, this is a story that I'd like to tell, and I use the book not to get, this is not a footnoted dissertation about history, uh, but rather telling stories about history. Uh, I love this one because the telegraph was, again, the first uh, kind of uh, mass communication uh, in the United States using electricity and so on. You're familiar with the, the telegraph key at the top. But the first telegraph really is developed more as a fax machine than a telegraph. You see that other device below. And you see a long tape there that has a message, what hath God wrought? That was the first message that Vail and Morse transmitted back and forth to each other in Washington, from Washington to Baltimore. What it is, is you do the dot, dash, dot, dash thing, right? But it would imprint on paper. And so that device down below is a register that would print out a tape. And then you'd look at the tape, you'd see the dots and dashes on the tape, and then you'd translate the dots into a W and an A and a T and so on. Well, you know what happened, again, with inventions? They take interesting turns. And so with the telegraph, well, what happened is telegraph operators would listen to the stuff and they could hear dots and dashes. They didn't need the printout. And so that part of the invention disappears. Now, what the telegraph was first used for, my boss's predecessor, his predecessor, the first secretary of the Smithsonian, Joseph Henry, was a physicist. He was very much interested in weather. In the 1840s and 1850s, what he did is he sent thermometers and barometers to people around the country. And he called them correspondents. We call them weather buddies. And he said, he taught people, here's instructions, do the temperature, do the barometric, and then every morning telegraph to the Smithsonian what the weather's like in Cincinnati and St. Louis and other places. He'd wake up in the morning at a map of the United States, he'd start mapping that, that became the first weather map and the origins of the weather service. And of course, for a farming country, an agricultural economy, that was vitally important. But it was the first example of what I would call crowdsourcing <laughs> and citizen science. And that led to, to understanding the weather. OK, this is an interesting object. It looks pretty big up on the screen. That would be a <laughs> chunk of gold. <laughs> I mean, Stuart, if you had that, Alex, if you had that, Long Now Foundation would be doing pretty good. But, but it's not a gold meteorite. This, this, this object is really about the size. Uh, it's about one-fifth the size of your pinky nail. And this was the flake that James Marshall saw in January 1848 at a place called Sutter's Mill. This is the flake that started the gold rush. This was then taken from California and delivered to the President of the United States, that time Polk. And this is the one that kicked everybody off to come to this state. This is why it was so crowded in San Francisco this, uh, this afternoon during rush hour. Very poignant object for many of us at the Smithsonian. This is Abraham Lincoln's hat. 
Uh, Lincoln was a tall guy, about six foot four. And the hat gave him more stature. A lot of, ge of his generals and colleagues were worried this would make him a bigger target for people to shoot at, which they occasionally did. But the, the top hat, unlike the fur cap, gave people respectability. And Lincoln, it, it, it signaled sophistication. It was a change in American life, wearing of top hats. It showed you were more urbane, sophisticated, and so on. So Lincoln needed that in order to deal, of course, with, with the country and the war. Uh, it's very poignant for me because you see that black band going around the middle was a black band that he put on for his deceased son, Willie, his son Willie, who died when he was in White House, 1862. And Lincoln put this, it's almost like a badge of mourning. And he did that because the whole country was mourning over its sons, lost in the Civil War, whether north or south. So it was a very public uh, display of what was going on at the time. Uh, Lincoln... Uh, wore this hat on April 14th, 1865, when he went to Ford's Theater. Came into the theater, play stopped, standing ovation. He sat down, he put the hat next to him, sat in the chair, and then, of course, he was assassinated by John Wilkes Booth. So when we see this hat, you know, it has like the perspiration stains of, of Lincoln on it. it. You could feel and touch history. When, when Stuart talked about digitization and doing so much, it's exactly right. You can have a representation, but when you look at that hat, you feel Lincoln. Now, what we do is we do a lot of uh, Lincoln and Civil War scholarship, and, you know, sometimes you have stuff in the Smithsonian and you don't know quite what you have. Uh, we have this watch. You see the initials on it, AL. This is Abraham Lincoln's gold watch. We'd already heard stories about this, about in the family that there was stuff written in Lincoln's watch. We didn't know whether to believe it or not. Well, Harry Rubenstein, the, the curator of Lincoln's watch, you know, says, hey, this is about two years ago, you know something? We should open that watch. <laughs> There's a lot of stories about what's inside of it. So we popped open Lincoln's watch. What did we find? Well, we found all sorts of things written in there. I'm not sure you can read it from there. You maybe make it out. You see what the arrow's pointing to? It says Jeff Davis, Jefferson Davis. So Abraham Lincoln, during the Civil War, is carrying around a watch that his watch repairman had inscribed the name of the President of the Confederacy. And so you get these wonderful cases where you, you know, kind of just gives you a sense of what was, what was, what was happening and, and, and kind of unknown history. Um, we have many Civil War objects that document issues of uh, slavery and African-American life. I, uh, Harriet Tidman's Humnal and uh, 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 amber types were amber types of Frederick Douglass. Uh, I love this little pocket copy of the Emancipation Proclamation. Really tiny, little, but this is what was that Union officers took into the field to tell people they were free, because they would read from it in 1863. Uh, a point in story and something that, uh, again, we have members of the Smithsonian family here, some of the members of our, of our national board and other uh, advisors who are close to the Smithsonian, but, you know, the Smithsonian, you know, partook of American history, a 167-year-old institution. Look at that medal. That is a medal that a woman, uh, uh, it's Christian Fleetwood's Medal of Honor. Christian Fleetwood was an African-American soldier who won the Medal of Honor in the Civil War. His granddaughter in, in 1947 tried to donate it to the Smithsonian. The Smithsonian curator said, no. We can't collect this African-American material. It'll start a whole collection, and this isn't relevant to American history. <laughs> now remember, at that time, that's the museum. That's your national museum. But remember, our baseball was segregated, our armies were segregated, our life was segregated. And so, you know, the, the museum in some way and its collections reflect some of that, uh, what we have now under construction on the mall is a new African-American history museum and culture museum next to the Washington Monument. should be done in a few years. And you'll be amazed at what's coming out and what's coming into the collection as a result of doing this because many African-Americans throughout the country are coming forth with things that before they would not donate and are now aren't. And it's just amazing the types of things we're finding. Um, this painting, I don't know, a Bierstadt? Uh, the, uh, the Albra, you know, among the Sierra Nevada, California, I don't know, Shelby, you're on the board of our American Art Commission. I mean, this is worth a lot of money, right? 
Yeah, lots of money. I mean, if this was on the market, I don't know, maybe it would be worth 60, 70, 80 million dollars. In the Smithsonian's rather large uh, painting, um, Al Bierstadt used to charge two bits for people to see it <laughs> back east. That is, these were the paintings. He came to California, painted these scenes, and these mythologized the West for people in the east. And then he'd have a, a curtain and everything, and it was a great drama to whew, show the painting and show people what out west looked like. And it was a way of enticing uh, settlement. Uh, interesting stories we have at the Smithsonian. The, um, I find, anyway, uh, the, the, the buffalo. We had a guy at the Smithsonian who was a taxidermist. He wanted to stuff buffalo in the case. He didn't know what buffalo looked like. He was a guy from the east. How do you know what, you know, musculature, everything like that? So what does he do? He goes west. He looks for buffalo. Couldn't find any. 1880s. Could not find buffalo. Finally found a few buffalo. Didn't have the heart to kill the buffalo. Named one of them Sandy. <laughs> Took them back to Washington. Put it in a corral on the mall outside of the Smithsonian Castle. People loved it. All of a sudden, people were coming. He had to get more animals. It became Noah's Ark. That was the origin of the National Zoo. <laughs> it was also the origin of the conservation movement, of realizing that we were wiping out species and what we're going to do about it. So Hornady teamed up with a guy named Teddy Roosevelt, Bronx Zoo and others, and it led really to the conservation movement. So too did this chap. Uh, this is one of uh, Stewart's uh, friends. Uh, um, this is Martha. This is a case where the, the, the label at, 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 uh, for Martha in our Natural History Museum says the last of her species, extinct. Martha died at the Cincinnati Zoo on September 1st, 1914, at 1 p.m. It's an amazing case to know that we know when the last of a species died, exactly. It was Martha, her companion had been George, right, George and Martha. The people at the Cincinnati Zoo put her on ice, shipped her to the Smithsonian. And at one time, when you look at Audubon's writings, when you look at writings around, there were billions of passenger pigeons. Martha died, there were none. You know what that is? Alexander Graham Bell's telephone. Look at your cell phone, this is where it began. <laughs> and again, doing amazing work on this. So Alexander Bell left a lot of recordings. And uh, he was fighting with Edison over recording technology. Edison won, but Bell had developed stuff. And he had recordings that he deposited in the basement of the Smithsonian. And we had to figure out how to play like 100 years later. <laughs> now, thankfully, we got, where's Mickey? Mickey Hart? Here's Mickey Hart, uh, known, maybe known as the drummer for the Grateful Dead. That's how you know him. But I know Mickey as an amazing ethnomusicologist who's worked for the, with the Smithsonian for decades a sound engineer who's helped us recover the sounds of early recordings and figure out how to make stuff available. And I think it was Mickey's influence here uh, that won a fellow uh, over at Livermore, the uh, uh, MacArthur this year, working with the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian to optically read and recover these sounds. So you could actually hear Alexander Graham Bell going, Mary had a little lamb, little lamb. <laughs> but when you think when you think, I'm thinking long now of recording languages and giving people in the future an idea of what we were like, you start thinking about the preservation of these media, how to play it, what equipment you're going to need, and how that's going to work. In the book, I deal with Edison's light bulb and the Model T and the Wright Brothers flyer. And this amazing object, you all recognize it. This is the, A sugar cane, alien, spacecraft. <laughs> this, as one, our curator in American history says, was the birthplace of the polyester kingdom. <laughs> this is the Bakelizer. This is some Belgian guy came to New York and invented something called plastic. Never been exhibited at the Smithsonian. I think our curators think it's a little too hideous, but I had it included in the book. It's amazing. <laughs> Okay, another one. A little surprise. Uh, anybody ever hear of Bernice Palmer? Nobody's heard of Bernice Palmer, but you know Kodak camera. Bernice is a 17-year-old girl. She wants a Kodak camera. Kodak cameras, early 1900s, way of democratizing experience. Anybody could document their experience, take a picture. No big chemicals and all that. 
Bernice Palmer gets a, a Kodak camera for her 17th birthday, gets on a ship to take a cruise with her mother. It's called the Carpathia. They're out in the Atlantic. They get a distress call from the Titanic. Titanic. Who has the camera? Teenage girl. She's the one that takes the pictures of the iceberg. It's a little hard to read on the picture. She's the one that takes the picture of the survivors. She's the one who, when they get back to New York, all the reporters are clamoring. It's her pictures that go around the world. Can't be an SF jazz without showing some of the popular culture stuff. Louis Armstrong's trumpet, among many objects in our collection of about 20,000 musical instruments. Uh, we do have uh, Mickey Mouse, uh, the cell from the Steamboat Willie, um, Dorothy's red slippers. Uh, just very quickly on those, you know, in the script and in Frank Baum's uh, book, The Wizard of Oz, they were not ruby, they were silver. The reason they became ruby was because of the invention of Technicolor that made them really shine. And when you stand next to them, as I do, and play around with them, you see they're really more brownish and burgundy. And <laughs> I have not tried on the ruby slippers. <laughs> Size five and a half or six. Think about technology, the television set. I don't know, maybe when some of us were smaller, when I was a kid in the 50s, I remember those Art Deco TV sets. But look at the TV set. You didn't watch the tube. You watched the mirror. You watch the reflection. Another one that Mickey worked on, the recordings of Woody Guthrie. This is the original lyrics of This Land is Your Land that Guthrie wrote. And this is the original acetate recording. This Land is Your Land, originally titled God Blessed America. Again, that acetate is decomposing over time. And so one of the, you know, one of the challenges is how do you move from media to media to media to keep ahead of technology so you keep playing it but, you know, the challenge is how do you preserve these precious artifacts of our history? In the book, I deal with poignant stuff. Look at the date on this hand stamp. Oklahoma, December 6, 1941. The guys in the Postal Museum on the U.S. Oklahoma did not get a chance to change the date that Sunday morning in Pearl Harbor. Very poignant. Tuskegee Flyer at the Smithsonian that will go into the New African American Museum. The We Can Do It poster, right? You think it's Rosie the Riveter? It's not. That's apocryphal. It became Rosie the Riveter, but that's a story you'll have to read. I deal with Japanese-American internment. Certainly in this state, it was very, very poignant. Tomorrow I'm going to a, a benefit for a good friend, uh, uh, Senator Dan Inouye, who passed away early this year. He was in the 442. He's kind of the guy in this picture as his wife is holding an infant under a guard tower because she's interned. He's losing his arm and winning the Medal of Honor. And in the book, I don't shy away from things like the Enola Gay, and tough ones, certainly the Cold War. Neil Armstrong's spacesuit, kind of one of my favorites. One, because it was mythic. Here were people, here were human beings. We walked on the moon. Who would have thought? How possible? But the other reason I love it is because how did it get to be that way? How did it get to be designed that way? So when they first did it, it was a guy thing. The idea was to design the spacesuit so it was hard, aluminum, fiberglass. You couldn't move. I'm from New York. When my mother dressed me up to go ice skating, it was like this. You could never move. <laughs> You'd never be able to walk on the moon like they'd first designed the spacesuit. So they held an international competition to design the spacesuit. Who won? International Latex Corporation, better known as Playtex. <laughs> so as one wonderful commentator said, Neil Armstrong took a giant step for mankind and even a larger step for ladies' girdles, brassiers, and underwear. <laughs> but it was the notion of layers and flexibility that allowed us... So, so sometimes you have invention from the, un, you know, the most unimaginable quarter that has tremendous uh, effect. In the book, I deal with the civil rights movement from the Greensboro lunch counter to Cesar Chavez's union jacket. Uh, and, and, and short hoe that was banned here in the state, the AIDS quilt, uh, we have panels of the AIDS quilt, and of course it's been very moving, uh, something that originated here, and to have that on the National Mall of the United States stretching for literally miles has, I think, really affected national consciousness when it needed to. Uh, we have in the Smithsonian objects of popular culture, like Chuck Berry's Gibson guitar, the one he called Maybelline. They won't let me play it. 
the Bob Dylan poster by Milton Glaser, influenced again by things happening with the Jefferson Airplane and Grateful Dead here in San Francisco, Marilyn Monroe's uh, uh, lips, and one of my more favorite objects, it was delivered in this box. Anybody know what that box held? Yeah, hope. It's under your seat. Look under your seat. <laughs> <laughs> the Hope Diamond. Postage, Harry Winston, $2.44. Imagine. Mailed to the Smithsonian Institute in Washington. Okay. So, let me tell you, and, and it wasn't a publicity gimmick, Harry always did that. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, inside story. And in the book, I go behind the scenes to tell the stuff you'll never get in the museums. It's really the inside story, behind the scenes story. So, the Hope Diamond, um, y you all know uh, uh, Napoleon, right? He was a guy in France, okay. So, <laughs> you know, in the French Revolution, the French crown jewels were looted and stolen. They kind of disappeared. And Napoleon, in conquering Europe, wanted to get the French crown jewels back together and reunite them. They, Louis XVI had the greatest collection of jewels in, in, in the world. And one of them was this blue diamond, the French blue it was called. That went to Britain. It became the Hope Diamond later. Okay? Cut down a bit. Charles de Gaulle, remember him? He wanted to do what Napoleon could not and get it back. So, his guy writes to the Smithsonian and says, hey, we'd like that Hope Diamond if you could loan it to uh, an exhibit at the Louvre. Well, what do you think we said at the Smithsonian, us curators? Right? We're not dumb. Like, what are you kidding? No, I mean, we were polite and everything, but we weren't going to loan the gold the Hope Diamond. So who did he go to to get him to get the Smithsonian to do the Hope Diamond? He goes to the lady living in a white house down the block. It was 1962 by the name of Jackie Kennedy. So Jackie Kennedy calls the head of the Smithsonian and says, I would like you to send the Hope Diamond to France. The head of the Smithsonian is apoplectic. <laughs> what you, it's, it's the biggest showstopper in the Smithsonian. People are coming, you know, they think it's cursed, has all these stories and whatever. So he, he doesn't know what to do. So he calls the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, who serves as the Chancellor of the Smithsonian. That guy in 1962 was a Californian by the name of Earl Warren. He says, do I have to listen to Jackie? <laughs> the Chief Justice says, yes. <laughs> what are we going to do with the Smithsonian? So we do what only a good curator would think to do. We take, no, we didn't send a, hey, real stuff at the Smithsonian. Real stuff. We decide, you, know, you look in your curatorial manual, and there in chapter 5.3, it says, if they want something that you don't want to give, take a hostage. <laughs> so we say, we'll give you the Hope Diamond. Uh, you got something we'd like you to loan to us. So we sent the Hope Diamond to the Louvre, and the French sent to us an interesting lady with an enigmatic smile <laughs> by the name of Mona Lisa. In the museum, we have Julia Child's kitchen. Our curators went up there. Julia Child, great you know, introduction of French cook, a woman who broke the, 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 the male chef line. And uh, Julia Child, we went up there to collect a few things. Let's get a few pots and pans, some of her French things, whatever. The curators were so taken by Julia Child's curation, they said, we have to collect the whole kitchen, <laughs> including the kitchen sink. <laughs> And that's what we did. So that's come to, the, come to the Smithsonian. We have McDonald's arches to illustrate American globalization and R2-D2. Uh, today I was down looking at the Computer History Museum down in Mountain View. We have the original ENIAC, and there's a piece of it there. Just imagine, this is a computer. <laughs> there were 40 here. In fact, there was a computer you did not compute on, you computed in. You in, you really in, and, and at first, computer referred to females who did mathematical calculations. They were the computers. And of course, we have the, uh, the, the first uh, Macintosh uh, uh, computer. 
Uh, we have objects of uh, media-based arts, and I was talking to Stuart before, this was done by Nam June Pike, and really helped uh, articulate the notion of the electronic superhighway. Look at all that neon and the notion of movement and so on, but it's all done with tubes and things that are not made anymore. So here you have media-based arts, and when you start thinking, maybe we'll send this to the Long Now Foundation to take care of No, our head of Smithsonian American Art Museum would go ballistic if I suggested that. I did not say that. Take that off the tape. <laughs> But here you have a real problem. The artist intended this to be driven by the technology and machinery of the time, and yet the machinery and technology of the time is disappearing. These bulbs, how do we preserve the artwork? It's a, it's a very interesting uh, problem. Uh, this one, PCR machine. Um, that's what it looks like. That's what enables the reproduction of DP, uh, uh, DNA. And it has tremendous consequences, as we know, in terms of our society. Now, sometimes we collect things at the Smithsonian. They have a purpose at one period of history. It changes over time. You remember the miracle on the Hudson? Plane went down. Bird strike. Whenever there's a bird strike in the country, they take the bird pate. I don't want to disturb your dessert here. <laughs> bird pate from the engine. They send it to the Smithsonian so we can figure it out. That person in charge of that project, forensic or anthology, is a woman whose name is Carla Dove. <laughs> She's the one that has to figure out what birds hit the plane so we could prevent it in the future. She's the one that says, ah, Canadian geese, blame it on the Canadians. <laughs> but it's made possible by the PCR machine, and so th th that happened on the, mirror, you know, the, the, the uh, uh, flight with the uh, Hudson, and this is the data set we have to do it. Millions and millions of birds. So if we can't identify it by DNA, we're using feathers, we're using beaks, we're using other body parts to figure out what bird hit it. Uh, at the Smithsonian, we have things that tell very poignant stories, like a piece of the Berlin Wall, obviously. We collected after 9-11, the fire engines of first responders and coins from the Pentagon and a flight log from a, a flight attendant went down to Shanksville on 93, sheathing from the World Trade Center. Very poignant, very tough. Curators like to collect the good stuff. This is a very tough collection effort. We also have, um, and I want to include in the book, the fact, you know, the earliest objects documenting American culture, American Indian, but I want to make the point that American Indians are indeed still around. And so object number 100 was a totem pole still be done today by David Boxley, using new technology, but telling traditional stories and keeping alive an art form that helps tell his, his, his uh, his uh, community's uh, stories. Now, things come to us in amazing ways at the Smithsonian. I know you're all anxious to donate everything you have to the Smithsonian. <laughs> the, um, we had a delivery, what, two years ago of one object. It was the uh, uh, space shuttle Discovery. Came in over Washington on 747. We had the Enterprise, named by all those Star Trek fans that had been in the Smithsonian, the test vehicle for the shuttle program. We put both shuttles back Neck, to, you know, nose to nose. We had about 40 astronauts, including John Glenn. It was an amazing, amazing uh, spectacle, and that uh, space shuttle is now in the Smithsonian. Now, some stuff is, you know, driven in uh, or flown in. Other things come to us in other ways. You remember the pandas? They came to us from China. Anybody remember what the U.S. gave the Chinese in return for the pandas? Milton and Matilda. Oh, Milton, Matilda. Muskox. We got pandas, we gave them muskox, we got the better of the deal. <laughs> but, you know, when you get pandas and you get two pandas, you often get other acquisitions to your collection, like 71A, <laughs> the baby panda now. Now, as Stuart uh, intimated at the, at the Smithsonian, we're increasingly digital, and, you know, like other institutions, at first you have websites, and you take pictures of what's in your collection, and then you start using it. I'm really partial to that leaf snap thing, because it made me sound so intelligent. We have zillions of leaves at the Smithsonian, and so we did a database for them. You do an app, and then you're out walking with your kid, and your kid says, Daddy, what kind of tree is that? hold up your phone, take a picture of the leaf, it references the Smithsonian collection, and all of a sudden you say, oh, it's a blue ash originally from Minnesota. Then. <laughs> I mean, you, know, you know, kind of know everything. So it gives people access to our collections. We're doing a lot of crowdsourcing. We have four curators of philately and six million stamps. 
physics problem, if they, or algebra problem, if they work for how many years to catalog every stamp? Impossible. But what we're doing is crowdsourcing that among philatelists so they can help us do research. We're increasingly using digitization to enhance our exhibition collections. And this one I love because what we did, we had a collection of Buddhist sculptures from caves from China. We had the sculpture in the Smithsonian. The Chinese had the caves, but the caves were all looted and gone. We were able to recreate the caves and then put the sculpture from the museum in situ in the museum, creating that gallery. So you can really understand where, what role they occupied. As you saw, we're increasingly digitizing uh, our collection. It's not easy, it's not flat, it's not as easy as Google. Uh, in terms of Google Books or flat things, flat, flat scanning, because you have to scan, as you saw with the gunboat Philadelphia at the beginning, complicated objects, you're imaging, you know, complex skeletal remains, layers of sculpture, but we're finding that it's pretty good to print stuff. We could actually print Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> you know, Monticello couldn't lend us the statue they have of Jefferson, so we just printed our own. And you can start studying things. So, you know, the Wright brothers, if you go to the Smithsonian, and even our curators can't get that detailed eagle-eye view of how the Wright brothers really flew. But you start doing this high-resolution digital technology, and you could study, you know, the mechanics of the Wright brothers' craft and innovation. We're doing an interesting uh, uh, thing. Uh, 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 Danny Hillis is here from the Long Now Foundation. He has a buddy, Brand Farron. Uh, who we're working with now, uh, and Shelby Gans again from our commission on at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. We have this gallery next to the White House in Washington, right on Pennsylvania Avenue, the, the Renwick Gallery. And basically what we're looking to is the possibility of turning this into a digital gallery. So you can experience things in a different way with very, very high resolution uh, uh, works in that gallery, and it could change. So at two o'clock, it could be a gallery of world portraiture. But at 3 o'clock, you could change it into a streetscape and do it for performance. Or what I, as a cultural historian, really love is that you could make the walls of the museum disappear. And you could look at Washington. And you could look at Washington in 1960. Or you could look at Washington in 1880 or 1830. Or you can have an event in, Vers in the, in the you know, Palace of Versailles or in the Taj Mahal. So increasingly doing that kind of thing, the use of digitization. And then finally, what I love, and again, my wife, the, the school teacher, says, Richard, I love taking my kids to the Smithsonian. I can't do it in no time. What are you going to do to bring the Smithsonian to my classroom? She's in Virginia. What do I tell teachers in Iowa or in uh, uh, Alberta or in Korea or in Chile? And my answer is, with 3D printing, you, too, can own the Hope Diamond. You can print it out. <laughs> you can print out George Washington's sword or Benjamin Franklin and use objects as mnemonic devices to teach about history, science, technology, art, and so on. I just tell my wife when we develop that, really fully develop that, just remember when you're pushing the... when you're going to recreate the, the space shuttle, remember to, pr to push the reduce button. But I think the idea of bringing the collections, bringing the value of the collections to teachers around the country and people in, around the world is a great thing. Again, nothing like seeing the real thing. <laughs> it's heavy, hefty, but important. <laughs> but there's nothing like seeing the real thing. But if you can't see the real thing, to try to give people a visceral experience of what that's about. So why don't I stop there? And I think we have some questions, Alex, and uh, I'm glad to take questions, and thank you very much. Have a seat. Okay. Shortly, because the uh, first question is, what do these objects of our past show? No, no name here. About our uh, present and future, have you thought about America's future and 102 objects? We're having a speaker next year who's doing the future and 100 objects. Um, mm -hmm. So you don't have to answer that one. Someone else will. Well, 
Well, now, I, I, I kind of do, look, I have to answer this all the time. You know, like, how come you didn't include the teddy bear? And how come you didn't include more things of popular culture from the presence? And why isn't Barbie in there? And then I have to deal with uh, Stephen Colbert, who uh, <laughs> donated his uh, portrait to the Smithsonian a while ago. <laughs> We hung it in the men's room in the portrait gallery. We did accession it. And I'm, I'm sure he's going to quiz me on why it's not in the 101. <laughs> <laughs> I got a coffee cup from his show when I was playing it. They said, you can't take that. And I said, well, actually, I'm going to take it. But that's what they do. See, they, they tell you you, still you can't got that take it. And then you really Can treasure it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like the whole diamond. It's only valuable if you have to steal it. Um, <laughs> Pat Tufts asks, what is the most famous object where the popular understanding of it is completely wrong? And yeah, maybe the most interesting provenance. What, you've told a lot of stories here, but yeah. uh, there's stuff that people have notions about. And museums are partly to reward notions, but also partly to undermine notions. Sure. What are some of the good underminings? Well, um, you know, I, I mean, as a story, and I think the one with the Declaration of Independence, because people go and they, they view what they think is the original copy of the Declaration of Independence is not, and then they take the copy that they buy, that parchment, mm -hmm. and they unroll it, and they think that's, you know, a real facsimile of the real Declaration of Independence, and of course that was made in 1823. Oops after the fact, and the Declaration of Independence wasn't signed on July 4th, some people didn't sign until August and September and November. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what it introduces, you, you get something like that, it's so iconic and so basic. What are you telling me, July 4th isn't, you know, really this, and they didn't <laughs> sign it that day, and all of that, and, and it, you know, kind of exposes people to the kind of nuances of history, what was going on then. We were already fighting a war, we didn't begin the war afterwards, George Washington was already fighting for a year. So, we get, we get stuff like that out of history. So we do fireworks on July 4th. What should we do on July 2nd? Yeah, well, <laughs> celebrate John Adams' day. <laughs> <laughs> Catherine asks, everyone is wondering what objects were close but didn't make the cut. I, was there were a whole lot of people involved in what was involved in this, and, and uh, you made the final cut, or how did that work? Uh, well, I, uh, what I did is I consulted with a lot of my curators around the institution and different museums, and people had their suggestions, and as you can imagine, people have strong opinions. So we have a National Postal Museum. You know, we have philatelists. They sent me over lists like, why can't everything be a stamp? Right. <laughs> I think they sent a hundred, so I, I could choose one, you know. Well, anyway, we had a lot of people doing that, so mm -hmm. I got a lot of suggestions from my fellow curators. What I relied on a lot was the American people. You know, we get 30 million people who come to our museums every year. We get another over 100 million that come online, and what do they gravitate to? And so you take that into consideration. And then there were things where I just ignored everybody mm -hmm. and uh, included some objects like the Bakelizer and like the Kodak camera because I thought, you know, it was a wonderful story that really nobody knew about and wasn't that obvious. Plus, you'd already done the whole book on the Hope Diamond, as I Yes, recall. I had. So, so I had to include that. I was a little partial on that one. <laughs> Um, the opposite question, Will Payne asks, besides the original Declaration of Independence, what objects lost to history do you wish was in the Smithsonian collection? Ooh, gee. That or is... what objects do other people have? That well, that's, wish... that's the thing. If you go through the book, um, there's a lot of objects from other museums, and I don't want to take it away from oh, uh, those museums. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, kind of... Uh, a lot of museums in this country, and they should have those items. So what I do in the book, for example, in talking about the, the John Bull, the mm -hmm. locomotive, I talk about, okay, the joining of the Transcontinental Railroad, mm -hmm. promontory point, and that that golden spike is a few miles from here down at, the, at Stanford's museum. Right. So we don't have the golden spike in the Smithsonian. I mm -hmm. kind of like it if we did, but it's kind of cool. It's somewhere and it's safe. So, but I do include a picture and description and a discussion of that object from other museums. Yeah, well, do that that, how about Lost to History? What are the ones that you just wish would turn up from somebody's basement? Gee, that is, that is, uh, that is tough. I think you know, for, a, a lot of letters get lost. You know, a lot mm -hmm. of documents uh, uh, like that get lost. You, you wish you had all the stages of some inventions that, you know, very often, and we see this, I was just down at the Computer History Museum and talking about how they got their collection. And they said, you know, the, the, their, their view anyway was that the companies they were just as prone to move, always thinking ahead, so, mm -hmm. oh, that's the model, we didn't, you know, throw that out. 
And it's often the engineers that were developing those who said, I worked on that. You know, that was my thought. I put my heart and soul into that. You can't throw that out. And so they find at that museum, they said to me, about 95% of the computer stuff, mm -hmm. circuit boards, I mean, circuitry, machines, and so on, is actually donated by the people who worked in the industry, mm -hmm. who kept it, put it in their garage, put it in their basement, and then later donated to the museum, because they thought it was important to document their role in history. And I think that's, that's always important. You said stuff is turning up for the new African American Museum, which is taking shape, I guess. Is that going to be on the mall? Yeah, right next to the Washington Monument. Yeah. And what kind of stuff is turning up from people's Well, as I said, you know, Harry, you know, it's kind of amazing. Uh, you know, uh, letters, uh, uh, George Washington Carver, Booker T. Washington, but Harriet Tubman's hymnal. I mean, Harriet, mm -hmm. Harriet Tubman was influenced very early on in her work in the Underground Railroad by a, an experience she had. We think it's probably seizures or something. She took it as a religious experience. She's a very religious lady. And here's her hymnal, you know, that really inspired, I mean, you know, scores of people to freedom. And all of a sudden that turned up last year and we, we, we got it. They, the Tuskegee Flyer, great story. There's an ex-Air Force guy, I think out of Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. Him and his wife bought this flyer at an auction. It was all beat up. The, the story was it had been used as a crop duster. They wanted to fly, they wanted to go to fly shows, they start restoring the plane in a way they wanted to do it for these shows. And then the guy figured, you know, I better check the serial number and see what this is. It turns out it was one of the original Tuskegee trainers. He completely switched course. Mm -hmm. He then designed the, 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 the plane as a Tuskegee flyer, as it was in the 1940s. Mm. He then went to Tuskegee Airmen reunions. He had Tuskegee Airmen fly in the plane, he'd take uh -huh. them up as a biplane, you know, with a passenger seat for the instructor it used to be. Mm -hmm. They'd sign the plane, mm -hmm. and then he made his last flight. He said, my God, this is bigger than me. Mm -hmm. He did his last flight, he went from Tuskegee, Alabama, mm -hmm. and he flew it to Washington to donate it to the Smithsonian. So, you know, you get stories like that. Uh, you know, people feel part of history and they feel they want to share that. I, I think it's a great a great impulse. And, you know, we always point to Smith's and he didn't know this country and did it. This is a country that prides itself on volunteerism, that people do and solve problems. And, you know, increasingly with government the way it is, you know, it's hard. <laughs> but I, I think we can never lose sight of the fact that we as, as citizens get together to actually try to solve problems and do the right thing and do the good thing. And we see it every day at the Smithsonian. There's something about objects that... Um they have hidden aspects, and your story of, of Lincoln's watch is a nice one where you finally open it up and look at that. Jeff Davis. <laughs> and I can tell you one that is going to prove valuable, which is uh, Martha, the last passenger pigeon that you have that is, you know, a standard taxidermy. It's the skin and feathers, and there she is, pretty well mounted, ugly bird. But you know, she was a really the, the guys old look better. Lady. The guy, I mean, the guy I, passenger yeah, pigeons. Yeah, George is, I've seen yeah, George. Yeah, yeah. Uh, better dressed. They, yeah. you know, pigeons usually are, are di not usually dimorphic, but passenger pigeons are. But the cool thing is that when Martha was shipped in a block of ice from Cincinnati Zoo down to you guys, they not only kept the skin, they kept the body and the guts. In those guts is a very important thing which we need to study, which is the microbiome, mm -hmm. the pigeon poop that hasn't been pooped out yet, uh, to find out what how passenger pigeons actually ran their mm -hmm. digestive system. Because if we're going to recreate the passenger pigeon using a band-tailed pigeon, yeah. we would like to know, you know how to basically recreate the microbiome of that. And you guys have the data, and you didn't even know it. <laughs> <laughs> pigeon shit. You we, we, we've <laughs> actually talk, we've talk, there, there, There's another story here. I mean, we've talked about this uh, quite a bit. Michael Neymark asks, he's a uh, digital artist, so um, would you advise a digital artist to reconsider the value of physical stuff? <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and how would you advise, and in Nam June Pike, you guys broke your butts, it looks like, to try to reproduce the antiquated television sets. There's all kinds of you know, video games out there that you can't play unless you have you know, all of the apparatus. So yeah. what do you guys do about that? Well, well, you know, we did an exhibit at the American Art Museum about video art and video mm -hmm. games. We actually took a little heat from that, you know, to do that in the Smithsonian American Art Museum. But I think it was a, 
a good choice and a good choice by our curators because art changes, mm -hmm. uh, you know, art takes on different forms. And I think we wanted to recognize that digital art and the digital artistry and design that goes into these museums. It was a very, very successful uh, exhibition uh, at, the, at the museum. Uh, so we are collecting, we are mm -hmm. collecting digital art, we're collecting code, mm -hmm. we're collecting uh, a lot of things. The challenge is how to, how to kind of capture that and not, not change it. So we, we had an exhibit at the uh, Hirshhorn uh, about two years ago uh, called The Cinema Effect. Mm -hmm. And to do the exhibit, you know, we created galleries. We had, you know, it was kind of smoky. That's mm -hmm. when people still smoked in theaters. And we had projectors running. And those of you who remember film, remember that sound of the film going through, you know, I mean, it's such a feeling, it creates such an ambiance. And so we had to do that. Well, try to find those films. Now, uh, with, with Mickey Hart over here, you know, who's really helped us engineer a lot of the old recordings that we have at the Smithsonian and the Library of Congress, you start thinking, okay, you need the machines to play those recordings. You know, just think if you have wax cylinder recordings, if you have tin, you know, they, when the early experimentation with Bell and Edison was on all sorts of media. And just like you guys will, you know, I don't know whether you take it as experimental or not, the different media, you know, but it is experimental. You don't know what the next bit of technology is going to be. So, you know, you invest in a certain technology and then you realize, oh, that was Betamax. <laughs> You know, that was a palm pilot. <laughs> that wasn't the thing to invest in. So it kind of moves. So what we have to do with the Smithsonian... Yeah, what's <laughs> interesting is we expect Betamax to live on in a museum, even though it doesn't live in popular culture. <laughs> you wish, but we need a Betamax player. <laughs> and you need a wire recorder player. And you need something that can play cylinder recordings and so on. So you, we end up at the Smithsonian keeping a whole inventory of these machines. Well, okay, next step. Mm -hmm. So... Next generation, you inherit these machines. You have rows and rows in the Smithsonian. And, and if you have any doubts, the Smithsonian has 19 national museums. We have 850 buildings. Where do you keep all that 137 million things? It's just like that scene. You remember the last scene in Indiana Jones? You know, That's exactly what it's like. Mm -hmm. So now you have rows and rows. Now you have an old recording machine. And you're interested in what the Navajo language sounded like mm -hmm. in the 1890s. Yep, and you want to play it, but you, need a, you not only need a machine, you need people who have the knowledge to play the machine. You have people that have knowledge to fix the machine. <laughs> and so that's it. Now, we had a guy at the Library of Congress, uh, John Howe, Mickey worked with, I worked with. He was like, he, he would go to uh, flea markets. He'd look around for old pieces of stuff. He would jerry-rig stuff in the basement of the Library of Congress to be able to play these old machines. Mm -hmm. He passed away uh, rather suddenly and unexpectedly. He really hadn't trained someone. And so like it's uh, those old novels, and it's like humankind, you know, where you have a, a kind of oral history and you have to pass something mm -hmm. on. And we take a lot of that for granted. But a lot of our knowledge is oral, is passed on in that way. And if you don't do it, you can lose it. And that, we lose languages. Look, look how many languages we're losing every year in the world because of that. Say a little bit about the ongoing research in the world that the Smithsonian is doing, because you know, we, we got that Smithson said he, he wanted not only the diffusion of knowledge, but in a sense the creation of knowledge. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm aware of, you know, you have laboratories in uh, Central America and things like that. How much of, of the Smithsonian is scientific research, not just having to do with museum huge, displays? Huge, huge. We have 500 people in Panama. Okay. who do research on tropical biology. Mm -hmm. We own islands in the Panama Canal and in the Atlantic and the Pacific, and we're studying everything from coral reefs mm -hmm. to you know, the movement of organisms between the Atlantic and the Pacific because of the, canal, uh, the Panama Canal. Uh, our work there goes back to the days of the Panama Canal and trying to understand the diseases that are affecting workers. So that, that facility alone gets, I think, somewhere about 900 researchers from around the world who take up residences in our laboratories and field sites in Panama to try to understand. And it's very interesting in terms of speciation, the environment, you know, now we're dealing a lot with, you know, the frog virus that's mm. killing all the frogs, because here you have a point in Panama, you have a thin spit of land that connects two continents, right, North and South America, and it also connects two oceans mm -hmm. <laughs> in a very small area. So the idea of biodiversity within that 
very small space That's great. leads to a whole slew of scientific research that generates, you know, scores and scores of papers and publications and so on. Similarly, what a lot of people don't know, when I showed you the telescope, it's not just we're building the telescope, we have 350 astrophysicists that operate that telescope and others. If you go to the big island of Hawaii and go on Mauna Kea, the Smithsonian facility up there with telescopes. And there, we're trying to understand the origins of the universe, we're trying to understand black holes, we're trying to understand cosmic energy. We run, actually, the Smithsonian actually runs six satellites for NASA. So we actually, you know, have guys with T-shirts and joysticks, uh, you know, running satellites to uh, and gathering the data and doing experiments and, you know, driving devices into the sun. I, w I was up at the facility. Uh, we, we, we uh, our location of that, our chief location of that, is up at, with Harvard, in Cambridge, and you know they were showing me. I mean, we do real time um, uh, uh, representations of the sun. I mean, huge, you know. Mm -hmm. And you're standing there in a basement, you know, in, in Cambridge, and all of a sudden you're seeing on the screen this solar flare coming out of the sun, you know, from millions of miles, and you're ready to duck and cover. You know? <laughs> but, but we monitor things like that, and it's important. We monitor it so that, because that has an effect on cell phones, it has an effect on navigation, it has an effect on all sorts of other things. We do a lot with wildlife and speciation. So, mm -hmm. I mean, we've been the leaders in panda reproduction and figuring it out. We do a lot of work. We've been doing a lot of work the last few years on avian flu. We have a lot of birds, all those birds. Mm -hmm. So you understand the disease vector. So mm -hmm. th there's a tremendous amount, and that just touches, that's a sign, you know, mm -hmm. just touches the surface in science from studying meteorites and species and other things uh, to our cultural studies of, you know, history, mm -hmm. uh, of art history and so on, uh, and various cultural fields. So it's pretty, it's, it's a lot. Yeah. Well, that's saying... Art, art to zoo, we say. <laughs> and the zoo. So I'm getting a, a flashback to the Library of Alexandria, which is really yeah, a museum. A museum, yeah. And was also, in a sense, the first university. It was, to some extent, a teaching university. It was mainly a research university. Are you guys a, a better model of how a university ought to be? Well, it, you know, it's kind of interesting because we have relationships with, you know, scores and mm -hmm. scores of universities uh, around the world, and we do a lot of teaching, and, you know, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of us hold, uh, you know, Plus this whole public interface, I mean, way ahead of MOOCs and all that yeah, stuff. You I, guys I, have been I, teaching the general public. I, I think that's, that, that is the thing, and, and the issue is, you know, where do museums rest in that? You know, mm -hmm. in some ways we do very formal things. I mean, we get, uh, you know, about a... Uh, 1,200 interns a year that come from universities all over the world. We get postdocs and pre-docs and senior postdocs who come to the Smithsonian who work there. I, I think the issue in terms of 30 million people that come through the doors, another 100 million, hopefully up to a billion that will come online, is it's hard to measure mm -hmm. certain things about it. Now, if you're doing something like a formal course, you know, we can give everybody... All you people come to the Smithsonian, you're going to get a test when you come in the doors and test when you leave would be a little hard to do. Mm -hmm. It's hard to measure inspiration. Hmm. And I think one of the things that we do do is you never can tell. It's kind of unpredictable about whether, you know, somebody's going to see something in the Smithsonian and just a spark of creativity mm -hmm. is going to be engendered by that exhibit. And that's going to cause them to go home and do something great, you know, that year, the year after, or years later. So we have a hard time kind of measuring mm -hmm. that impact in the, as far as inspiration. But as far as formal education, we have, you know, two Race to the Top grants. We, we work a lot in schools across the country. We work a lot with Teachers of the Year uh, across, uh, across the United States. Uh, I think one of the things on education is we feel that we do hands-on you know, object-based, participatory, involved. You want to teach somebody how to invent a rocket ship? Build one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I think we're in that end of the business, and I think what we've seen with No Child Left Behind in this country is an orientation more toward, you know, rote memory, what's the name of this, memorize that, and the kind of creativity, exploration, discovery, failure, success kind of going out of the education business, hmm. at least in the primary and secondary school uh, environment. And that, that, that's kind of distressing to us. Why don't you end with something you told me about in the car coming over here, about when there was, there was a... Not the secret project. No, no, not the secret project. <laughs> oh, no. 
the was it a poor people's march in Washington or something oh, yeah, yeah, like yeah. that? Tell me, tell us about that. Yeah, I was telling Stuart about because I was talking about my origins at the Smithsonian, and uh, when I came, I was recruited by a guy Dylan Ripley, who's pretty patrician, uh, New England uh, uh, family. Uh, was in the OSS with Julia Child in Ceylon. He, he I parried, love a sentence like that. He, <laughs> Dylan, who I knew very well, I did a lot of travel, he's an ornithologist. Margaret Mead and Gregory Bateson were also in all yeah. the, anyway. That's so, so Dylan, I mean, brought a tuxedo, mm -hmm. so when the Japanese surrendered, he would have be properly dressed with a tuxedo. <laughs> he was that type of guy. But uh, when the poor people, uh, when there was a poor people's march in uh, Washington, uh, uh, 68, okay. uh, the um, uh, he, some of the directors of the Smithsonian came to him and said, let's close the museums. These are poor people, they're uneducated, they're going to dirty the museums, people will take stuff. They're going to fill the mall, was that Fill the mall, yeah, it was fill the mall, it was protest uh, on the mall. This was following the Martin Luther King march uh, several years before. Right. People built a poor people's city. There was a mm -hmm. village of... Uh, and, and so the director said, close the Smithsonian. Who are these people? And Dylan Rapley, as patrician as he was, said... My God, no, these are Americans too. And they don't usually visit the, the Smithsonian, and we have a duty to them. And not only are we not going to close the museums, we're going to keep the museums open all night. And people said, well, they'll go to the bathroom. <laughs> they'll get water. And he said, yeah, that's the point. <laughs> <laughs> and while they're going to the bathroom, and while they're at the water fountains, they might see a sculpture of Shiva in the art museum, you know, with four arms or six arms or eight arms, and they might get interested in that. And we, too, have a role in awakening their curiosity just like we do any other. So they, kept, they actually kept the museums open 24 hours a day. It was, it was I think, a high point. Uh, for the, you know, sometimes museums can be looked at as elitist, and you're always protective, and uh, kind of like what you were with Charles de Gaulle and Hope Diamond. But I, I, I think it's a different day, and I think the idea is to share knowledge and really be true to that original idea that knowledge plus the democratization of knowledge equals a progressive and better society. 24-7 open source. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.